Shabbat Shalom, everybody, and thank you for joining us this beautiful Shabbat. <clears throat> and um, I want to welcome you to Parasha Chaye Sarah, which means the life of Sarah. And today we're going to be talking about when Hashem, or God, calls. Uh, so before we start, I'd like to open this time in prayer. As always, Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this time to be in your presence, and I ask you Teach us, again, that which you'd have to teach us and that we would have hearts to learn and the ability to put it to practice, that which your word says. I ask that that which comes out of my mouth, again, will not be from my flesh, but from your Holy Spirit, your Ruach HaKodesh. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus. Amen. So my name is uh, Rabbi Harald Clint Fry here at uh, in Perugia, Italy. And I just want to welcome you to this, again, another Shabbat. I love Shabbat. It's a, a time of the week when we can just put aside all the stress and the, the appointments and the work and everything else and just rest, rest our minds, rest our bodies, and above all, rest our spirit and read the word of Hashem, the word of God, and just enjoy his presence. So uh, I really really look forward to a Shabbat. The Torah portion for this week comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 23, verse 1, through chapter 25, verse 18. And the, the Haftarah, or the prophetic portion, comes from 1 Kings, chapter 1, verses 1 through 31, and Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 23, and also chapter 27, verses 3 through 10. Also Luke, chapter 9, verses 57 through 62, 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 1 through 7 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 50 through 57. I also want to thank you for those of you who prayed for me. My lungs are healed after this horrible week of trying to deal with um, breathing problems. It was uh, definitely not fun. And uh, I've been, it's always a weak point in my life since I was a teenager, unfortunately, but uh, that's where the enemy likes to try to strike me the most, where I need to speak and speak the truth and, and preach the gospel. And that's where he wants to get me. So thank you for your prayers. I feel so much better this week. And I really appreciate all of you who join in and listen and watch our videos. We couldn't be here without you. So we love you all in Yeshua. I just want you to know that we do not take any of you for granted. And we appreciate each and every one of you. So we're going to start with Genesis 23, 1, the very first verse. Sarah lived, or Chaye Sarah in Hebrew, to be 127 years old. I can't even imagine that. <laughs> so she died at Kiryat Arba, that is Hebron. If you've been there, it's a very interesting place, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went to mourn for Sarah and to weep over her. So last week in the parasha Be'era, Abraham entertained angels. Remember, two of them were angels, and one was actually... Yeshua himself, Jesus, who appeared to him as men after he received the covenant of circumcision. One of the angels announced to him that Sarah would give birth to a son in a year from that point. And then Parashah Sarah, or the life of Sarah, like we said, begins with the death of her, death of Sarah in Kiryat Arba, or Hebron, in modern day Israel, at the age of 127. Ends with the death of Abraham at 175. He lived a lot longer. So <clears throat> the lives of the great matriarch and patriarch of our faith come to an end, at least for now. Both of them are buried in the cave of Machpelah, which is a very interesting place to go. And it's quite neat to see the huge, gigantic tombs that they've created for our patriarchs and matriarchs, and which is actually cave of Machpelah means cave of the patriarchs in which Abraham had purchased as a family burial site from the sons of Heth for the full price of 400 shekels of silver, which is, imagine, a lot of money, even though he had been offered the land for free. He said, listen to us. You are a mighty prince among us. This is Heth. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will refuse you his tomb for burying your dead. <clears throat> so in this week's Aftarah, or the reading of the prophets, or the prophetic portion, it echoes also the theme of the end of an aging ruler of Israel, one of the greatest men of Hashem, God's man of all times, 
and then after Hashem's own heart, King David, who is a wonderful, I can't wait to meet him personally. I've seen his tomb also in Jerusalem. It's a lot smaller than the other people's, but it's pretty neat to go to if you get a chance to go. And it says in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 1, King David was now old, advanced in years, and though they covered him with bedclothes, he never felt warm. So in this portion of the word of Hashem, we are confronted with the transitory nature of life. We know it's short. Even if we do live to be 100 and some years old, it's still short. And our, we are reminded of our own mortality. Although Hashem is eternal and his word is forever, scripture actually compares our existence to a flower or a blade of grass. It says in Isaiah 46 and 8, and also 1 Peter 1 24, it says, all men are like grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. So it also compares us to vapor in the wind that is here today and gone tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away, James 4.14. 4. Think how quickly that goes, a lot quicker than grass or flowers. So Chaye Sarah reminds each of us that our brief time on this earth will come to an end. And you can find this in Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 2. Psalm 90, 12, it says, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. I, I pray that for myself. I, I really need to realize, hey, my, I'm 53. I'm not old, but I'm not a youngster anymore. Not, and and uh, the older I get, the faster the years go. It seems like a year starts and now it's already ending. And uh, compared to when I was younger, the, the years seem longer. So it's kind of weird how the, the older we get, life, uh, time goes faster. And it's important to realize, hey, I'm not here for myself. I'm here to serve the Lord. I'm here to bring glory to him with my life. And I, I've failed so many times, but I always ask, please forgive me. Please give me another chance. And he is so wonderful. He does give us that chance. And it's really cool how he does that. Now, I want to talk about, speaking of this, I want to talk about death and eternal life. Or we can speak about death and eternal death. So, but God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. Psalm 49, 15. Now, in some version, it says, from the power of Sheol. What is Sheol? It means the pit. What is the pit? It can be many things, okay? But for those who are not saved, it can mean hell. So, it's only when we face the certainty of physical death that we can actually be comforted by the truth that, he by the truth that heaven is our true home. For those of us who believe in Yeshua. Okay, we're only passing through the fallen world that we're in as pilgrims and strangers. And when I think about what's going on around us, I'm truly grateful for that. I'm not part of this world. And I hope that you can say the same for yourself. So while our forefathers also, you know, ate manna in the wilderness and they still died, Yeshua, Jesus, said he was the bread that comes from down from heaven which anyone may eat and not die. In John 6, 50, notice it says anyone. It doesn't say just those that I choose or, or those I feel like letting eat from my bread. No, anybody who wants to eat from his bread. That is anybody who wants to accept him as their Moshiach, their Messiah. Okay, so he boldly proclaimed himself as to be Lech Chaim, or the bread of life. Okay, or Lechem Chaim, I'm sorry. So, and promise that whoever would eat this bread would live forever in John 6, 58. Hashem has promised us that whoever believes in his son, Yeshua, will never perish, but will have eternal life in John 3, 16. What does that mean to never perish? That means we're not going to go to hell. We're not going to be tortured and, and agonized forever and ever in tens of thousands of degrees of fire and horrific, horrific eternity. It's beautiful. So just as a tomb, which I've seen also in Jerusalem, it's a, in a place called the Garden Tomb. It's really cool. It's right just about a few feet, really, from Golgotha, the, the, the mount where Yeshua was crucified. We will also be raised to a new life. So the tomb could not hold him. Death cannot hold us, though, for those of us who are in him. We will be raised to a new life in him. So this is really beautiful, glorious, and a revelation that just frees us from the fear of death like many have. 
right? For those who are not um, in Yeshua, it's a, death will be a fearful thing because it's not going to be good for them. I just uh, discovered yesterday, actually, that one of my a dear friend of mine, who I knew as a teenager in high school in Florence, went to the American high school, who had contracted MS, had just passed away last Friday. And I'm extremely saddened because um, I really hope that in his time of sickness that he had this MS, I'm hoping that he had somebody who spoke to him of Yeshua, of Jesus, uh, to help him come to accept Jesus as his Messiah, as his Savior. Uh, unfortunately, I never got the chance to go. I wanted to, but I couldn't. So I really hope that that's where he's at now. But if not, then I, I'm, I'm grieving for him. And, and, I, and it truly saddens my heart. And it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? So yes, even if we die and we are in Yeshua, <laughs> it's only a momentary thing. Because eventually our bodies can be resurrected and joined with our, our soul to be in eternity in heaven. So this is our hope and our assurance from the word of Hashem, the word of God, which removes from us the fear of death. And so there's kind of a quote also for our movie, a movie that's uh, called Tuck Everlasting. I've never seen it. Um, so I actually, I just saw this little section of it where it talks about, kind of puts another whole spin about death. It says, one character encourages another by saying, do not fear death, but rather the unlived life. So think about it. Those who didn't live life, <clears throat> especially for Yeshua, that's that's a horrible thing. How many people die every year, every day, who were not in Yeshua and they think of all the things they've done in their life? They caught a amassed riches and wealth and property and things and oh, who knows? Could have had anything they wanted in life, but in the end, what did they accomplish? Absolutely nothing. So, despite the reality of death, or because of it, we should embrace life and live it fully. However, that doesn't mean just living to, to, to satisfy our flesh and do whatever we want. No, it means to do it meaningfully and with joy to the best of our ability for the glory of our King, okay, and of our Father. So, I'd like to pass on to a different subject. Talking about the bride out of Babylon. And you're saying, what are you talking about? <laughs> so it says in 1 Peter 3, 4, the ever shining ornament of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great price in the eyes of Hashem. So in this parasha, Abraham undertakes um, to find a suitable bride for his son, Isaac, or Yitzhak. He sends his servant on a mission to find her from amongst his relatives. It's kind of weird that back then they, they would find a bride or, or somebody from amongst the relatives. But we're talking about, you know, a brother of the um, of Abraham. So somebody who's related, but not too closely. Abraham made his servant swear by the Lord God of heaven, by Adonai, uh, the God of heaven and earth, that he would not take a bride for Isaac from among the Canaanites, who had been cursed by Noah. And if you go out, you can check out uh, the parasha Noah that we just had a couple weeks ago. Abraham's servant found Rivka, which is Hebrew for Rebecca, in Babylon, which is Mesopotamia, city of Nahor. Okay. And if you think about it, Babylon is modern day Iraq in that area. So the place Hashem had called Abraham to leave in the first place, if you remember last week's um, parasha. So he prayed to Hashem that Isaac's bride would be revealed to him by her providing water for him and also of her own initiative, his camels. So imagine the time and effort it took to draw enough water from the well to quench the thirst of 10 camels plus the people. That's a lot of water. <clears throat> he had to dip the bucket way down in there, haul it back up. It's not like we have now where a lot of people have electric uh, uh wells or even maybe even a hand pump which would be a lot easier than pulling up a bucket so in proverbs 12 10 there's a beautiful uh verse that says a righteous man cares for the needs of his animal 
but the kindest acts of the wicked are cruel. And I've seen some cruel people in my life. I used to know somebody who posed to be a friend and he would treat his animals horrifically for no reason to torture them and be really mean to them. And it was horrible to see. And I thought, how is it this person can have such an evil and wicked heart? So, uh, you know, you can tell the character of a person by how they treat not just people, but even animals. So the bride is revealed through her compassion and kindness, especially towards the animals, the weak and defenseless in life by diligence, willingness to go that extra mile for others. So Rivka's outward physical beauty reflects her inner beauty and character. She was a beautiful woman. So obviously she was beautiful outside and inside. So it's this gentle and quiet spirit that is precious in the sight of Hashem. Okay, and we can find this in 1 Peter 3, 4. You know, you can have the most beautiful person on the outside. If they're mean and evil, they are not beautiful, at least in my eyes. So Rivka also reveals that she is the one by her willingness to follow Abraham's servant out of Babylon into an unknown territory, in an unknown land, <clears throat> in order to marry Yitzchak, Isaac. She's asked, will you go with this man? And she answers, I will go. She didn't even meet the guy. She doesn't know if Isaac is a good looking guy or not. If he's nice or not. She says, hey, will you go? That's incredible. <laughs> you know, nowadays people want to date. They want to go out and get to know each other before they get married. And half the time, you don't even really get to know the person while you're going out because they show a whole different side. And once you actually are with the person, then that's where the real person comes out, right? They always say, if you want to marry somebody, sit in traffic with them for a couple hours in, in like stop and go traffic or something like that, or, or see what happens when they have no internet or very extremely slow internet, just something they can maybe show you what the true characteristics of a person is. Check them out. See how they are during the winter, or during the summer, or during the spring and the fall. It's important. But many people got married without even really knowing the person back then. So Rivka doesn't shrink back in fear. She's bold and courageous. She strives to bring comfort to others by her love and good character. Each disciple of Yeshua must decide within his or her own, her own heart whether they are willing to follow the Messiah and submit to going where the Ruach HaKodesh, or the Holy Spirit, leads them on a daily basis. And it's not always easy. Sometimes you lead you on good, easy paths. Oftentimes, no. So oftentimes, some, say some, some people say sometimes, but I think it more often than not, the Holy Spirit will take us out of our comfort zone our familiar home and ask us to follow him to a place that he will show us. We don't always see the whole plan or the big picture. This can be pretty scary for, you know, for most of us. Oh, I want you to go to Africa or whatever. People say, oh, I'm going to be a missionary in Africa. I'm okay. I want to see you go. I want to see you actually go. And once you get there, you know, there's a real test. So yeah, it looks great, you know, pictures and stuff and videos, whatever, but it is not easy to go somewhere you do not know. Leave the comfort of your home, especially in America, where you know people are used to their comforts, great comforts. Every time I visit America, I think this is fun, but I also have to remind myself this is also very fake. You know, all this air conditioning and heat and stuff and this and that, and it's not too expensive yet. You know, abundance of everything, ease of everything. That'll all come to an end, as you can see what's happening right now. But how easy is it to get caught up in that and not want to go where Hashem or the Holy Spirit tells us? It's really important. But we can remember also, we don't travel alone when he calls us, right? Hashem promises to be with us wherever we go. He upholds us and he will never leave us or forsake us. This is a promise. So if he says, hey, I want you to go this, here and do that, he's going to not only open the doors for you, he's going to be with you. So we must strive to embody Rivka's diligence. Rebecca, servant heart, her beauty, her purity, her willingness, kindness, and courage, and faith above all, all right, in order to be the bride of the Messiah that 
Hashem or Adonai is waiting for. Now, I also like to talk about with this in mind, living lives that count. So in Ecclesiastes 7, 8, it says the end of a matter is better than its beginning. Hmm. So for Jewish people, where are we going to go with this? The day of one's death is actually often more significant than the day of one's birth. And you're thinking, how is that? We remember the anniversary of a loved one's death with the candle being lit. Special prayers recited about the holiness of Hashem called Kaddish. Now, remind, notice I'm not saying we pray to the dead, okay? Uh-uh, no. There are people who do that. That's wrong. The Bible does forbid this, okay? But it's just something to remind us of that person. It's beautiful. I can remember. I can remind myself on my brother's death uh, anniversary. It was in May. And just remember what a beautiful person he was. What a wonderful brother he was growing up and being good friends. And I can remember that. And I can remember that on the day of his death. I can also remember his birthday. But I also want to remember the day he went on to graduate into our eternal life. So a lot of people will, like I said, light, light a candle, say special prayers, and recalling the holiness of Hashem. And then we call it the Kaddish. So while Kaddish is commonly called the mourner's prayer, the words are not actually about death or mourning. Okay. Instead, they are a public proclamation of Hashem's greatness. So it's pretty cool. Even in the anguish of the loss of a loved one, loved one, especially if we know they were in Yeshua and we know where they're at, we can rise above our circumstances by offering praise to Hashem for who he is. So when we are born, it's a good time, right? Our whole life look, looks kind of lies ahead of us like a blank pages in a book. But when we die, <laughs> the story of our lives has been written, comes to a conclusion, at least here on the earth. So at death, we see whether or not our lives counted for anything. <clears throat> you know, how many people are going to show up here at your funeral or I remember there was over 200 people at my brother's funeral, you know, and then there's people I know who hardly had anybody at their funeral, maybe because they were just a really mean person. I don't know, but it's interesting to realize that while we know the time of Yeshua's death, which is during Pesach or the Passover, all right, not Easter, because that doesn't always coincide with Pesach or the Passover, I'm sorry to say, it's a good time to remember what he did. For those who celebrate Easter for that reason, all right, not the Easter bunny and all that other junk, we cannot be sure of the time of his birth. All right, this, is, this has been a kind of issue of some sort of controversy because the Bible does not say exactly the time of birth. It gives us an idea, okay? While most Christians celebrate Yeshua's birthday on December 25th, we know it's not possible. First of all, People would not be called to travel at that time to go to their hometowns for a sentence because it's really cold, even in Israel, especially in Jerusalem, where it can snow. And Bethel Bethlehem, which is right next to Jerusalem, practically. Well, many biblical scholars place the time of Yeshua's birth in the fall, later, like uh, end of September, beginning of October, which is still really nice weather in Israel, even in Jerusalem. So probably at the time of Sukkot, which is his feast of the tabernacles. This would probably most likely be the time when he was born uh, because it would be a good time to travel. It's not too hot like it is in the summer, not too cold like it is in the winter time. Okay, but it's just an idea. It's, it probably most likely is the time when he was born, but it doesn't say that. Why? Obviously, Hashem doesn't care enough about that to tell us. It's not important. It's important the fact that he was born. That's it. However, we can kind of guess because he was 33 and a half years old when he died. Well, there's those six months difference, right? Between the end of September and Pesach. So who knows? Could have been around that time. So what's, what does it mean to leave a legacy? Yeshua definitely left the legacy, right? <laughs> He's our savior. But it says in Ephesians 5, 5 through 16, in one of the verses, it says, look carefully, then how you will walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. And we definitely know that the days are evil now, right? 
oh my goodness, more and more evil every day. The governments are more evil every day. People are more evil and it's just getting worse and worse. And yes, people, it will get so bad. It says it will be worse than in times of Noah. You think about that. In times of Noah, what was happening back then besides all the sexual sin of all kinds, uh, deprivation, evil, and, and violence, but there was also cannibalism, eating people, eating animals while they're still alive, ripping parts off the animals and eating it while the animal's still alive, which is why later on in the Bible it says, don't do that. Why would he say that if it wasn't being done? Okay, people were eating people. There were giants, not just 10 foot tall, but 30, 40, 50 feet tall. These giants were extremely violent, killing people and eating them, right? Shedding their blood. So it was a horrible, horrible time. It's going to get like that and worse. That's what the Bible says. We'll be worse than the times of Noah. It's going to be horrible. But people, you got to keep your faith because yes, we will be around during that time, at least part of it. Okay. Abraham and Sarah's lives exemplified love and devotion to Hashem for one another and for their neighbor. Remember how Abraham had welcomed these strangers into his tent or outside of his tent and fed them, <clears throat> gave them water and drink. King David's life exemplified the love of Hashem, submitted ambition, and, the, and even so much more. The stories of the passing of Sarah, Abraham, and David in this haftarah or in this parasha should cause us to carefully consider our own lives. What are we going to leave as the legacy, people? I really pray that I will leave a legacy that only will people will see, wow, I really appreciate what he did in my life. I really pray that. I do not wish for anybody to think, good riddance. <laughs> That would be terrible. So what will we leave as a legacy? All right. We want to know we've made a difference in some way. That our life is counted for something good and positive. Nevertheless, all too often, we do get caught up in, it, in so many types of cares and concerns of everyday life that we fail to think about whether we are fulfilling our God-given destiny. Right? I've seen people who call themselves believers treat other believers like dirt, looking the other way and pretending like they didn't see me, not giving me help when I needed help. Where did my help come from? You know, often where our help has come from, my wife and I, people who aren't believers. And that's really sad. I've had help, more help from people who are not believers than people who say they are. So are we living intentionally and with purpose, people? Life is not a dress rehearsal, okay? Not something to just, okay, I'm going to do this. Okay, now I'm ready. We should make the most of this gift of life every single day. I need to remind myself of this too. I'm not perfect. I know I've had my times when I, I didn't help somebody who Maybe when I could have helped them. Okay, I'm just as guilty as anybody else. So I'm speaking to myself as much as anybody. All I can do is at, at, at that point is ask Hashem to forgive me. We still must not fail to have balance either though. Okay, some of us, so many people live empty, unsatisfying lives without direction focus and completely miss fulfilling our God-given destiny. <clears throat> Others are so goal and achievement oriented, and I've known so many people like that, that they miss out. They miss that which is truly and most important, that is loving Hashem and loving those around them. But whatever we do during our lifetime, may it bring honor and glory to Hashem and to his kingdom, and above all, bring people to his kingdom. We want people to come with us, right? We don't want people to miss out on a chance to have eternal life just because of our, our uh, the way we act or what we do or don't do. It's really important. So in closing, I want to uh, talk about <clears throat> the Canaanites. 
I want to go back to that. Why is it Abraham insisted that Isaac should not marry a Canaanite? What about today? How does that fit in with today's day, uh, these days? Is it safe to worship with Canaanites? What were the Canaanites known for? For their idolatry, for their worshiping of other strange gods who don't even exist, right? For many, many evil things. Offering their children to Molech as sacrifices and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Abraham warned Eliezer not to seek a bride for Isaac from among the Canaanite women. Like we said, Abraham knew that the Canaanites were destined to be ejected, thrown out of the land, and erased from history. There's a few Canaanites still around, unfortunately, because the Israelites did not do what they were told to do exactly the way they were told to. He did not think it was prudent, however, that his seed, to whom Hashem had promised this land, should marry within a race from whom the land was to be taken. So the Midrash imagines Abraham's reasoning. My son is blessed, and the accursed cannot unite with the blessed. All right, <clears throat> so we're going to get into a, a verse here in a moment, which tells us all that in uh, even the great Chadashah, or the New Covenant. So in today's world, there are no Canaanites. Well, there's a few around, I'm sure. But most of them have ceased to be an identifiable people group a long time ago. Okay, they're not called the Canaanites. They're called something else, whoever was left alive. Nevertheless, the warning still has relevance for our outreach efforts today. <clears throat> the Canaanite religion became an extremely toxic poison for the children of Israel, seducing them, like I said, into idolatry, and other many horrible things. Likewise, we must not bring the religion of Canaan into the house of Abraham or into the body of Yeshua. In our zeal to, to reach people for Yeshua, for salvation, to, or as some people say, to make converts, I really hate that word because it means nothing, but to have people come over to Yeshua, we should say, we should not allow the idolatrous world to exercise its influence over the assembly of Yeshua, the Messiah. And unfortunately, that's happening a lot today in his body. Okay, uh, many of the so-called churches or, or congregations are, are saying, yeah, it's okay, come on in. Anybody who wants to live their homosexuality. Yes, we want them to come. That's true. We want them to be saved. But we need them to preach the truth. Not to just say, it's okay. Yeshua loves you just the way you are. He's going to welcome you into heaven. Oh, it's going to be great. No, we need to call for repentance. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 to 16, it says, do not be yoked or bound together with unbelievers. That's talking about marriage, okay? For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness? What has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. So remember, people, it's one thing if you got married when you were not saved, or even if you were maybe saved, but you didn't realize the other person wasn't saved. There are a lot of people who are really good at faking it. Trust me. All right. When you are in, in your churches or congregations, check out who you're with. Study them. Make sure. They are who they say they are, because guess what? The enemy, Satan, likes to send his adversaries right there to trap people and ensnare them. Okay, so be careful who you marry. Pray, seek, crave some more. God, Hashem, will not allow you to be with the wrong person. This is so important. On the other hand, the disciple of Yeshua should have no hesitation about reaching out to the godless. That's what we're called to do. Whether they listen or not, that's their business. But the wicked, the secular, or the idolater, we need to reach out to. The transforming power of the gospel is not limited by ethic or ethnic or sociolo sociological boundaries. Like I said, reach out to that person living in such and such a way. Let them decide if they want to accept or not. The good news taught by our Messiah, Yeshua, can transform even the most reprehensible idolater, maybe what we call an evil person, 
maybe even a murderer, doesn't matter, into a worthy spiritual bride. I know so many people have on death row who accepted Yeshua as their Savior, Jesus as their Messiah, while they're on death row because they realize what they've done and that what horrible actions that they have been. And before they are sent to whatever horrible way of dying, at least they know they can go in peace. That's important. So these person can be sanctified no matter what through the blood of Yeshua, just like any of us. And we're all sinners. Just because I'm not in prison serving life or on death row doesn't mean I haven't sinned any worse or any better than that person. Okay, I am just as guilty of sin as they are. And I am just as guilty of going and, and should be thrown in hell just as much as anybody else. But I put my trust in Yeshua and Jesus and upon his death for my sins. That's the only difference. That's it. So it says, by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church. Huh? We could say the body of Messiah, okay? To all her glory, have no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but she should, would be holy and blameless. This is in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 26 and 27. Yeshua's disciples need to learn this lesson before they could be effective apostles. They were with him for three and a half years. So there's two incidents from the New Testament which illustrate the matter. The story of Yeshua's encounter with the Samaritan woman in John 4, and the story of Peter's encounter with Cornelius the centurion in Acts 10. <clears throat> so the story of the master's encounter with the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4 reminds us that in those days the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans in John 4 9. The Jewish people of the day considered the Samaritans as the equivalent of the Canaanites. <laughs> but the master put aside all the covenantal prejudices, prejudices, can't say the word, prejudices, sorry, it's not going to come out today, <laughs> and engage the Samaritan woman in conversation. His example opened the way for his disciples to represent the gospel to the Samaritan people and from there to other nations. So the story of Peter and Cornelius opened the scope of the gospel message even wider than that. Peter deemed that the Gentiles as outside the purview of Hashem's redemption. He did not think that they were within redemption. He regarded them as Canaanites, so to speak, that he never imagined taking the message of the gospel directly to the non-Jews. He had misunderstood the commission to go to all nations as a reference to the Jewish people and converts to Judaism scattered among the nations. Okay, that's what he thought. But the vision of the sheet that let down from heaven reoriented, it got his thinking to change, right? Peter's thinking. So the gospel is sufficient to save everybody, Jew, and Gentile. Remember that. So I know many people come in my path while I'm in America or I'm here. I don't care if they're Jew or Gentile. I don't care. If God tells me to say something to them, I need to say it. I might not know. I might not even see the results until I am in heaven. When I might see that person and they'll say, hey, that word you gave me, I heard you. I pray that so much. I really do. I do not want to see one person going to hell, even the worst person that ever lived. And if those of you who are listening or watching have not accepted Yeshua as your Moshiach, as your Messiah, as your Savior, and confess that you are a sinner, which we all are, now is the time you can do that. Before it's too late, before you do pass on into the next world, into your eternity. It says, like I said, those who believe in his son, and yes, God has a son. If you want, if you have a question, go back to Genesis 1. Elohim means is plural. Okay. It's plural. He's talking about us. Notice he says us. Let us make man in our image. Who is he talking to? The angels? Nope. He's talking to his son and the Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh. So, 
If you'd like to accept Yeshua as your Savior, please join me in this prayer. If you still have doubts, just write to us. There's a contact link below. We will send you a free book that will explain. If you don't want to, just read Isaiah 53. It is talking about Yeshua. It is not talking about the nation of Israel or anybody else. It's speaking of one specific person. Okay, so I want to invite you to say this prayer with me because I so desperately want to see people coming and accepting Yeshua, who himself was a Jew. Okay, he's not the, the, the white guy uh, that so many people depict as, as uh, Jesus, whatever. He was a Jew. He was born a Jew. And he died as a Jew. So I invite you to say this prayer with me. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam, Asher Natan Lanu Eterech HaYeshua B'Meshiach, Yeshua. In English, it's simply, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the way of salvation, Messiah, Yeshua. I want to thank you for joining us today. If you have been blessed by this, I'd like to, you know, if you leave a comment, I always love to hear from you. If you'd like to help support us in any way, we do have a, uh, a link at the very bottom for supporting. Uh, and if you can't have do PayPal, there are other ways to help. Uh, just let us know. There's a contact link below. We can let you know. Uh, if you feel that you've been blessed by our ministry, we could appreciate any support you would love to give. We never ask for anything. So may you be blessed in the name of Yeshua. Also, if you'd like to receive counseling, there is a link in the Machasei Shel Tikva link. It's uh, that the Gabriela, the Rebetzin Gabriela, offers through her website. She is a licensed professional counselor based on biblical principles. And you are welcome to see that and check it out uh, if you need help with any counseling for past or present issues going on or went on in your life. So I'd like to close with the ironic blessing. Yair Adonai, Yevarechecha Adonai Bishmerecha, Yair Adonai Panabelecha Bichunecha, Isa Adonai Panabelecha Bishim Lecha Shalom, Bishem Yeshua Hamashiach, Sarah Shalom, Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua the Messiah, the Prince of Peace, Shalom. Shabbat Shalom to all of you. Thank you for joining us today.